support. And then we shall take attendance. I don't think I have the world's longest lecture today, so plenty of time to work on other stuff, unless we get into some heated discussions, which could be possible. So tell me that you're here, and open. the topic of today's lecture is computer science and other disciplines, because this is a GE class. It's very likely that uh, a good chunk of you are not interested in majoring in computer science. What, what's the utility that you can get out of it, though? Where is it being used outside of CSI? Okay. Or CS. That's another probably more common abbreviation of computer science. You'll hear that a lot. CS just by itself. So, yeah, I guess the question is, we've learned some specific skills in this class. How well do they apply to computer science outside of this uh, CSI 1 classroom? Is like everybody, every software engineer in their day job just going around and making programs that draw things with turtles? If only, right? But they do not. What are they doing? And uh, how cool is it, I guess, is the question. So I'll try and answer that. But I do want to say right now that the stuff that we're learning is to prepare you to become a software engineer if you're ever interested in doing it. It will give you a lot of, um, it'll give you a good head start, I guess. That's what I want to say. So let's first talk about social science and art. Uh, that kind of gets into your next essay, right? That's out right now. So I think the first thing that I'd like you guys to do before I show you some examples is go get into peer instruction groups, have a nice little discussion, and see if you can write down some examples of computer science in the area of social science and art. Okay, how do you think that computer science, technology in general, is being used in this field? So humor me, please go to the, the written nice page and see if you can come up with a few ideas. And we can definitely discuss those. I have some pre-made things as well, though. Let me clear it on out. So you usually don't think about it, but what what's going on in those fields? They're not... Uh, maybe turtles do count in the art field. But think about this. It's not just a bunch of software engineers. What are social scientists and artists using programming and computers, computer science for? Okay. So take a few minutes to jot some ideas down, and then we can discuss. Some examples of social science, by the way, are anthropology, archaeology, economics, human geography, linguistics, So take another, I don't know, minute and a half. Jot down some ideas.
All right, that's my timer. So let's see what we came up with. Is uh, any group excited to share their ideas? Dun, dun, dun. I like the idea of digital art. We definitely talked about that, right? That is definitely something that we are all using computers for to make cool stuff. CGI, animation in general, uh, Photoshop, any artist can use that. Social science can use CS to analyze data and run simulations. Yeah, there's a lot of statistical software that needs to get written by somebody. And that is very applicable to like psychology, for example, where you do a lot of surveys and you try to get to the bottom of some research question. Yeah, these are all good examples. So uh, data representation. Yeah, every field these days, they're collecting information, right? They have to process it somehow. This is fun stuff. NFTs, oh man, that's a buzzword. Is that still a thing? Like, is it still as popular as it used to be? Did it? It was a thing for a while. And then crypto prices went down. Maybe that was the issue. What is this? Oh yeah, we talked about the deep fake stuff. That's a bit creepy, but definitely a use of uh, computer science, artificial intelligence, right? That's the whole branch. Uh, yeah, video games in general, uh, that is technically art, isn't it? And they hire artists as well as programmers. Sometimes uh, people do both. It's a very cool combination. Group 39 has some ideas, very nice. Oh yeah, all about stats, all about data. Every field needs that. They need to keep track of it. Politics and social systems. Smartphones in general, right? Every human usually owns a smartphone these days and they're interacting with apps and things. That's technically computer science, isn't it? Beautiful images. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. So, yeah, these are great ideas. Any uh, questions, comments about these? I have a few examples myself, but it just goes to show that there's more to just programming. You can apply it to things, right? That's the goal. That's what we want to understand. So let's talk about uh, a fun one, a social science-themed uh, slide. Let's talk about computational linguistics. I've talked about this a tiny, tiny bit, but let's go a bit further. So computational linguistics is, uh, I guess, you have human languages and you want to compute stuff about them, so you're going to put some computers to the task. All right. So some subfields of computational linguistics are speech recognition, even speech synthesis, having computers talk, right? And it's all about human languages. It's not like they're you're writing a computer program that itself writes a Python program. No, you're writing a computer program that speaks English, things like that. And a very, very important facet of computational ling linguistics is called natural language processing. I think I've used this buzzword before already. Uh, that is when you want to understand, right? You want to read, decipher, understand this human language, English, Spanish, whatever, okay? In a manner that is valuable. And it's NLP for short, that's why. But isn't that nice? We have a computer that wants to understand our own speech. And this is something that comes up a lot. Like you go on a website 
and they plop one of these uh, pictures up and like, it's like 3 a.m. and obviously this person is not real and awake right now, but they're able to answer your questions, right? You can type a full complete sentence these days, or even if you call some help desk on the phone, like if I called Apple, they let me talk to their automated assistant and they understand what I want, which is crazy. Uh, so you can ask a question, click the button, and then suddenly you're taken to usually something relevant. That's all computational linguistics. That's natural language processing. Any questions, comments about that? That's fun stuff. We have a tiny little bit of that inside of our smartphones, right? If we uh, ask Siri to do something, if we ask, what is it? Do you just say, hey, Google, if, we put, if you have an Android phone, I forget. But yeah, that's, that's computational linguistics. That is natural language processing. Here's what's going on. Think of all the things that need to happen in order for this to like actually do what it was intended. You speak. You say, hey, Siri, set a timer for five minutes. Luckily, my phone does not have that triggered. But the first step of this entire process, natural language processing, is getting this, because this is my voice. This is not text yet. It needs to be translated first, right? They need to understand the NLP processing unit on the phone needs to extract the text from sound. First of all, feeding a microphone, and then it's like, okay, hey, Siri. They're getting it as text. Set a timer for five minutes. And then at that point, this text needs to be processed. So luckily enough, we have English at our disposal. Uh, now we have to parse these words, right? That's what needs to happen. The first thing is Siri needs to know that we're talking to it. So it needs to notice that we said those first two words, right? That's exactly what it's looking for. And so that's some form of activation. And then the rest of the sentence is a command, right, usually. And so we have to then parse this sentence like we're in grade school. It needs to know what we're asking, right? And you have to figure it out. So it's like set a timer. That's a verb. Uh, set a timer. That's the object. That's what I want to be set. Uh, and then it's like, okay, I'm going to make a timer. Timers need a duration. I'm going to need that somewhere too in the sentence. And you can think of all the different ways that you could formulate that sentence to say the same thing, but in different orders, right? So that needs, that needs programming, right? Here's your duration. You could ask to set a timer in a million different ways. And natural language processing is the idea of trying to figure out all the different ways and making sure that your timer gets set, right? So from voice to text to understanding the text, that's natural language processing in a nutshell. It's very powerful, very useful, right? Text-to-speech is a big part of that. That is not the world's easiest problem to go from voice, because we all talk differently, right? Have different uh, tones, have different vocabularies. It's crazy, but possible. Okay. So that's NLP in a nutshell. Uh, any questions about that? I just have my fun examples, as I like to have. So uh, next thing, let's talk about human-computer interaction. This uh, is kind of under the hood, I would say, in computer science. Human-computer interaction, or HCI for short, it studies the interfaces between humans and computers. So we have human computer interaction specialists to thank for the mouse and some other very useful things that uh, are just commonplace these days, okay? So, like, let's see here. Some of those interfaces, right, they even work for non-humans. You've seen all the YouTube videos with monkeys playing apps and cats swatting at things. But, yeah, this is the idea. So, yeah, let me not draw this just yet. So, yeah, we have those researchers to thank for graphical user interfaces, first of all. Computers used to be just a bunch of text on a screen before, right? They used to look like this. Uh, this was your computer back in the day, but now we have graphical user interfaces. We have windows that we can move around. We can do things, and that 
that took research to figure out what worked. Like these X's and these buttons, like why is it a minus sign? Why does it have two boxes within a box? Like how can humans understand those symbols? All of that stuff had to be, had to be researched, had to be figured out. It's amazing. So yeah, fun stuff. And then mice were invented by Xerox as well as the graphical user interfaces. Uh, so surprisingly, you can thank a copier company for a lot of what you have in a computer these days. And then Apple stole their ideas. So that was fun. Uh, but they let them, so it's OK. And more recently, you're interacting with computers in a very seamless way. right? We have augmented reality. You have that whatever Facebook's trying to do, or Meta, as they're now called. right? You have Pokemon Go, where you put your you put your phone out, and it's, it needs to do so many things, right? It needs to figure out what's a good color. It needs to notice, like, the earth below you so that it can, like, orient the Pikachu right where it needs to be. A lot of processing needs to happen, and that's taken from your camera, right? And then you can do things. You can interact with the world through a computer, and that's kind of like the next step, right? That's where we're headed, theoretically. So that's a lot of fun stuff. So look at how far we've come. It was like everything was text-based, all this text. And then we have a bunch of windows now that we can click on. We have our little X buttons and things, windows. And now we have like uh, augmented reality, virtual reality. And maybe that's the next step. That's crazy to think about, isn't it? So uh, that's a fun idea. Any questions, comments about this? I don't know if I accept the fact that virtual reality is the next place that we're going. That doesn't seem the most fun thing to me. I don't know. I don't want to hear wear like a headset. But maybe, maybe that is where we're going. All right, next idea. Let's talk about music, because pretty much any music that we've listened to that has been recorded recently has computers to thank, right? All of the recording software in general nowadays is completely digital. We don't use tapes a whole lot anymore. So yeah, especially if you like electronic music, the first synthesizer, the first digital synthesizer came out in 1974. Not crazy. And nowadays it's just baked into every kind of music production program. So you got your Logic Pro, you got your Ableton Live, all those fun apps that you may have heard of where you can like throw music together digitally. That did not used to be a thing. You had to record every track, right? On tapes and splice them together. No, it's a lot easier these days. So uh, yeah, software can even, this is really cool, they can make your guitar sound like it's plugged into a very expensive amplifier, but you're just plugging your guitar into your laptop. It's amazing. And I'm sure it's just going to get better. Okay? So that is music production. Uh, and they're even using machine learning in music land to make things sound the way it's supposed to sound, to make these digital instruments sound like they're real life in front of you instruments. And so I think we all can appreciate that. And that is another place where computer science is being used. We don't think about it, but it's really happening, right? And then finally, we totally were talking about this in our write-up. We've talked about it before. But art, art in general, is a lot of the time computer-based these days, isn't it? So you have, uh, I heard a quote somewhere that the, the best composers of our time are probably the ones that are writing all the music for the movies, right? all the Star Wars theme songs and things, Harry Potter. And it's also very likely that the best artists of our time are probably painting digitally in like Photoshop or some other app, right? Because that is a place where you can create very easily. Does that make sense? So like there are plenty of people who work only digitally, right? And that, uh, that by the way, is this is all 2D stuff. Uh, and yeah, everybody has an Instagram account. They're, they're interacting with their followers. They're making digital art, or at least scanning it and posting it. We have computer science to thank for that. And then more recently, 3D artwork is very popular, especially if you're going to make like assets for a video game. 
you're going to make it in Blender, something like that. And I have been told, or I've I've watched little uh, I don't know little tutorials where you use your little tablet and it can check for your pressure, and it's like you're sculpting. You press in and you sculpt your 3D model with your hand, just like it were clay. So that's where technology is at these days in these fields, social science and art. Any questions about these uh, or comments about these uh, topics before we move on to a different field? just want to prove to you that it's worth it to study programming for a little bit. Just in case you're not convinced yet. All right. Uh, yeah, so if we're doing okay, I think the final topic that I want to talk about is medicine and science. And by science, I mean everything but computer science like biology, chemistry, things like that. So my question to you, just like before, take a minute or take a few minutes and write down some good examples of computer science being used in these fields, in the med medical field, in like the hard sciences, things like that. What can you think of? Okay, and then we'll talk about it. Let me close my terminal. And let me clear these out. But these were great things. Sorry to clear them out. Yeah, so take a few minutes to think about this. Because I think there are some good examples, right? Computer science has been very helpful for these fields.
Take about one more minute. All right. So, uh, let's see what we're thinking about this. Maybe we have more ideas because we've been exposed to a lot of STEM stuff in our lives. All right. Let's we'll scroll on up. Does any group feel like sharing anything important? I think they're dying to talk about. Or should I just read? All right. So, yeah. MRI, x-rays, that's very true. So what is an MRI machine but something that could like not work without a computer? Right? It needs to take that magnetic information, translate it into 3D coordinates so that it can plot and look at cool stuff, right? I, I'm definitely not a biologist, I don't, or a, a medical doctor. But I assume that you cannot do an MRI without a computer. Is that a true statement? There's no, it's not like an x-ray where you could, like, take a picture on some film somehow. Like, you needed a computer to process that information. They're just big electromagnets. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. You can make things a lot easier. Or you can do things a lot more precisely with a computer. That's a great point. And I do have a slide on that, even, about robotic appendages. So we will talk about that. That's a great point. And then, yeah, physics, all these particle accelerator things, that is uh, that's just a bunch of computers wired together at the end of the day, right? That's how that's working. That's very, very cool stuff. I think we can all agree. Uh, and, yeah, machine learning is being applied to more than just, like, computer science things. I mean, you got your smart cars, you got your self-driving things, but you can apply it to other kinds of science. You can apply it to medicine. You can try and predict, hey, does this look cancerous based on some training data? Yeah. And for some, I guess, ailments, I'm not really sure the right word there, but computers can be better on average for detecting certain things than a doctor can these days, which is crazy to think about. That's really, really cool stuff. So that's definitely very helpful, I would say, to society. Then lots of image be images being captured to construct the first picture of a black hole. That's super cool, too, right? So that's, what is that? What we call that physics? So, yeah, think of how much time it would have taken. Like, could we have even launched a satellite that was not powered with computers to keep track of how it was moving? I think not, right? So that's very good points, very good ideas. Uh, let's see here. Computer science has made it possible for systems to be created that could keep valuable information and data stored. Yeah, again, just storing data in general, it's very important for the medical field, right? We want to make sure that's confidential as well. There's a lot of cryptography going on there. Letting doctors communicate, things like that. That's very important stuff.
led to the create computer science has led to the creation of new machines and tools that open new possibilities in the medical field. Yeah, you know, the first thing that comes to my mind is like doctors remotely doing surgery, right, through a robot. Maybe one day it's going to be the robots can do the surgery by themselves. But that's really cool stuff. Any comments, questions before I show you my few little examples? All right. Some of these you totally have already brought up, and I'll just expand on them. But uh, one that I didn't see was weather forecasting. That is a lot more accurate these days, thanks to computers. And let me try and teach you how weather forecasting works, just in case you've never really thought about it. So, okay, what is the atmosphere but a bunch of fluid, right? Air is a fluid, and it moves around. And so you can model the atmosphere using your fancy physics, fluid dynamics equations, th thermodynamics equations, because parts of the air are harder than other parts. A lot of stuff going on. So, yeah, with enough sensors, and we're putting sensors all over the place, you've got them all over Fresno, all over the mountains, things like that. With enough sensors to keep track of the data at this particular point on the Earth, and enough computers linked together that can, like, farm and mine this data, you can do some really good predictions a lot better than it used to be, right? So let's talk about that. This is kind of the idea of what's going on. You gather your information from your sensors, like, here's a chunk of the Earth, right? Here's a chunk of the air, let's say. Let's pretend that it's a cube. You can predict the weather in this chunk of the air by keeping track of, all right, here's some temperature readings from all these sensors strewn about Fresno, let's say. And then here are some other readings, like the wind speed, like which direction the wind is moving at different points. And with all that together, right, combined, you can predict, like, okay, this pocket of air is going to move over here. It's going to cause this to happen. Of course, you kind of need this to be farther away than just Fresno to, to make any real predictions, but that's the idea. With enough sensors, you can learn what's going to happen. So at time A, you feed all this information into your uh, weather forecasting software, and it is able to run all these cool physics equations and figure out, okay, here is probably what that chunk of air is going to look like at time B, right? Here's what those sensors are probably going to say. Here's where the winds will have most likely shifted, all that stuff. And uh, it can do it with pretty good accuracy. Maybe it, there's some probabilities associated with it, like 77% chance I think the wind's going to be blowing that way. Maybe 12% chance it's going to be blowing in this direction. And so there is some guesswork involved, but it is quite accurate, a lot better than it used to be, okay? Uh, one issue that does come up is the farther you try to predict in the future, the more, like, randomness happens in the atmosphere, and so it, it gets a bit... That's why the weather in the future is not as accurate as the weather that they say is going to happen tomorrow, right? But still, it's so much better than it used to be. So uh, it's not the weather person's fault, it's just... They need a more powerful supercomputer that could have calculated the tomorrow's weather with greater accuracy. That's the idea. Okay, so that is weather forecasting. There are also some very important stuff that we care about living in this uh, very living in this valley, I guess. Like it's very hot, so we have not the best air quality a lot of the time, right? And so that's another type of forecasting, isn't it? That is not a problem. It's very similar, right? You have the idea of, okay, there's smoke from these wildfires, there, uh, there's pollen in the air, Where, which way is the wind blowing, giving my sensors. You can model, again, how good is the air quality going to be tomorrow. Just like that. That's not a problem. Okay? So just like weather forecasting. And again, you can throw your model off by trying to pre predict too far out into the future, or if there are some irregularities, because uh, this actually came up when I was looking at the air quality forecast when there were a ton of fires. Um, just like everything else, there's a lot of machine learning involved in, in forecasts. You only can predict based on what you've seen before, right? And those wildfires that happened that made our air quality horrible, 
we are uh, there was there was no prior data on that scale, right? Those were unprecedented giant wildfires, and so the computers kind of didn't have a very good time. They weren't very accurate in their predictions on air quality and things like that because they had never seen something like that before. Isn't that crazy to think about? So they're learning based on what they what they know. They're trying to make predictions based on what they know. And they weren't doing too well the first time everything caught on fire in like 2020. Okay, so that's that. There's also just wildfire simulations in general are helpful for firefighters, aren't they? You can predict like, okay, here's where the fire is now. Here are my sensor readings. Here are my predictions of which way the wind is going to blow. That is really helpful, right? It can help you see that, okay, maybe the fire is going to grow in this direction. We should put more people there. Oh, the wind's blowing away down here. Maybe we don't need to focus our attention there. Maybe the fire won't grow too much, but the fire might grow over here, things like that. And so that will give you a better chance at actually extinguishing the fire eventually. Right? And so these are a lot of things near and dear to our hearts as residents. Uh, forecasts. Any questions, ideas about that? So a lot of hardcore uh, simulations going on, a lot of processing power being thrown at the weather nature. All right. Yeah, just in general, I have a bunch of cool little examples. And that will be uh, our day. So the next idea is genome sequencing. Have we thought about this before? Have we tried the 23andMe kind of thing? I have not yet. But that's, that's fancy stuff, right? You need, just think of what what would have been necessary? You need a very powerful microscope and you need somebody like writing down every base pair of the DNA that they see. That's kind of not possible. But computers these days, they can take in a string of DNA and read it out, right? And be like, all right, here's some stuff. Uh, they can translate the DNA into all of their little uh, base pairs that they see. A, T, G, C, right? Whatever order that it sees. And so computers are necessary for this. And relatively recently is when we finally were able to uh, completely sequence all of the human DNA. Okay, I think actually, like last week, did anybody hear about this? I think they, I think I can take away the word mostly now. I think they did the whole thing finally. I can't remember uh, if there was some qualification behind that. But yeah, back in 2007 was when they used computers and some fancy machines to completely sequence, for the most part, all of human DNA. Obviously, it's not the same among everybody, but they got most of it, okay? And so they have all the, the DNA, the ATGC pairs that made up a human. And so that, that's useful for trying to figure out uh, they're trying to make medicines, things like that. I'm definitely not a biologist, but it's useful stuff to have, right? To know what's there so that you can predict what might happen to somebody uh, given a change in DNA, things like that, okay? So yeah, this is engineering and computer science, very helpful, and it's helping the medical field and other things. So yeah, that's genome sequencing and uh, a much less computationally intensive thing was 23andMe. Have we used that? Uh, so if you have, it, what it does, right, is they take, uh, I guess it's saliva, they take a swab of something and they go and they don't sequence your entire genome because that would be very expensive. What they do is they are able to uh, like test if certain pieces of your DNA match pre-existing pieces that are in their database. And that's how they can figure stuff out. So yeah, 23andMe, it's all about uh, ancestry. That's what it started out as. So it's like, here's your DNA that they get from your cheek swab. Pretend it's a helix. What they have is they, they send this into their machines uh, and it's not as expensive to do this process, this idea of, okay, let's look over here for this little chunk of DNA. Let's look for this little chunk of DNA. Let's look for this little chunk of DNA because 
this exact sequence tells me something. This tells me that uh, this person most likely has ancestry in like Western Europe, things like that. And so it used to be the case that 23andMe was only for that, for ancestry, for like, okay, here is, I don't know, my best quick drawing of Europe and Africa and all that stuff. Uh, what it was doing was, okay, I'm taking these DNA markers, I'm looking for them, and I can plot on this map where people commonly have those markers. So your origin, your ancestry. And nowadays they can also do the same thing for your uh, risk of certain diseases, right? Because that's also part of the genome for genetic diseases. They can look for little markers like, okay, you're most likely, uh, you're at risk for this disease because of this marker in your DNA for this genetic disease, which is crazy to think about, but very useful, right? And so maybe we should all get 23andMe done on that. But yeah, instead of sending all your DNA into a big machine to sequence it all, it's able to extract little pieces and check those little pieces for the markers that they know about in their database for uh, ancestry and also for genetic diseases. So that's my best explanation of genome sequencing and ancestry. Uh, I guess it's still sequencing, right? Any questions about that? Comments? Some people consider it to be a privacy risk to do 23andMe, right? Because suddenly they have, like, they can figure out who you're related to. That might be some information that you don't want to share with a random company. So there are some also, there's also some ethical ideas that we could talk about here. Uh, but we don't need to get into that if we don't want to. But that's a fun thing to think about as well. Apply our ethical theories to these, uh, these companies that are based around computer science and uh, medicine. Okay. All right, a fun example that we did talk about a little bit is robotic stuff. All right. So, uh, let's see, how do I want to explain this? Uh, yeah, in general, let me, let me give you this example first. This is uh, prosthetic versus like robotic things, because those are two terms that we might not know the difference between like what's what's the difference between giving someone a prosthetic arm and giving someone a robotic arm those to the layperson like me those sounded like the same term but here's the difference so uh all right person with an arm uh you think hey i want to move my arm and then it sends signals to uh your nerves in your arm to actually make that movement happen right so that's what happens uh, apparently. And if everything's okay, like your brain can still send signals down to your arm, then you get a prosthetic arm, okay? And the prosthetic arm can hook into the signals down here on your shoulder, okay? They're able to uh, read the electrical impulses from the nerves of the arm. That's possible, okay? So that's what a prosthetic arm means. They're hooking in right at the source. They can get into those nerves and that can move your arm. And then robotic arms though, they're for people with damaged spinal cords. So your brain can think, hey, I want to move my shoulder, but that information can't get down, or I wanna move my arm, that information can't get down to the arm, okay? It can't even get to the shoulder anymore. So that is when robotic arms come into play and you can just hook into the brain itself and tap into that signal. That's the difference, okay? So let's talk about a breakthrough that happened. Dun, dun, dun. So you can imagine that this is like, okay, we're putting sensors into somebody's brain. We didn't start out being very good at that. It got better over time, yeah. So it was 2019 when the first non-invasive robotic arm was made, believe it or not. So relatively recently, we finally didn't have to drill into somebody's brain to read those signals. This was this new robotic arm from this, uh, from this article, uh, or this idea. You could just instead put a bunch of sensors on someone's head, right? Read the electrical impulses just from the skin itself. And that is enough to read the brain activity to see like, okay, 
this signal was meant to go to the arm, let's move our robotic arm for this person. So that's really, really cool. And that's where we're going. Obviously, it took a lot of effort to get there to be able to, I guess this is technically machine learning, right? To be able to read those signals in the right way to, okay, clasp onto things to move up and down these robotic appendages. Which is crazy to think about and very, very useful to somebody who needs it. Any questions, ideas about that? That's really fun stuff. And it can only get better, right? It can only get better. All right, I have three more fun examples just to whip our brains into shape, and then uh, that'll be it. So again, as Fresnans, we are uh, involved in the agriculture business, a lot of us. So we have smart farms these days, right? So farmers, they can put sensors in their fields that can monitor stuff, right? Here's your field. You can put little sensors up and down it to send information back to your house. So the farmer doesn't have to go outside to check the properties of their soil, all that stuff. Very, very useful information. So you have some kind of wireless thing that's being able to read the information from these sensors. They're talking to each other. That's pretty cool. And so you can make a little network of sensors that are inside of your, your plot of land and they tell you soil information, uh, and potentially many other things that I don't know about, okay? So that's very nice. Uh, you can also, like, self-driving cars aren't a thing, but self-driving tractors are. Have we heard about that? That is very easy to do, relatively, right? You can't kill anybody with a self-driving tractor, most likely. So it's, it's a lot easier to program one of those than a self-driving car, because there's no way to hit. You don't have to worry about traffic rules. You just have, you just have to worry about okay, where is the edge of this plot of land that I'm supposed to go across and plow, right? Isn't that cool? So, yeah, all you have to do, assuming, like, your plot is rectangular, all the farmer has to do to make their self-driving tractor go is to, like, say, okay, here are the four corners of my land. This is where I want the tractor to be and go in this direction, maybe. Uh, and you can just hook a GPS onto your tractor. And it can plow in that shape, right? I can't draw a tractor. I'm not, gonna, not even going to try. But it can it can move around. It knows, okay, I'm going to follow this, and I'm going to stop when I get to the end. Isn't that crazy? That's super useful. You don't have to. You can, like, plow while you're asleep if you'd like. Stay out of the, the hot Fresno sun. So, yeah, that kind of stuff is a thing these days, surprisingly. You can make, uh, you can even like hook in your sensors to some kind of machine learning software to make predictions about, okay, the, uh, like the moisture level of my soil right now is on its way downward. You can learn the optimal point to turn on the sprinklers, can't you? That's pretty nice. So you have a ton of sensors that you put all around your land. You can make very nice predictions about, okay, I should water now, I should harvest now, all that stuff. You don't really think about it, but technology has made its way into farming even. That's really cool. All right. Questions about that before I go on to something completely different? All of these slides are completely different ideas, but they all have that similar theme, right? Computer science plus something else. And then, yeah, we're talking about uh, satellites. Just space and space travel in general requires computers, right? Everything that we did... Uh, was necessary, right? We needed computers to control things. It wasn't just humans, right? It never was. So, for example, you got your telescopes. Think of what goes on into even a telescope, something that's not even a satellite, not as fancy. It's just, okay, I want to look at something. Here's the Earth. Here's the distant star that I want to look at. Think of what you would need to do to like make sure your telescope is looking at that star always, because the Earth's moving, the star's moving. I want to focus on this thing. You have to use some software to do that, right? You don't think of that, but it's totally a thing. Satellites, just in general, they need to be able to interact with their environment. Like, okay, I need to 
I'm, I'm losing altitude, I better turn on my little thrusters or whatever. And you can have satellites that themselves have cameras on them, and you can make them orient themselves or keep track of something. And that's all software-based, right? Just sending data out there, take some software. And then all of our rovers, like lunar rovers, Mars rovers, those are all commanded to do things and uh, can be programmed and be reprogrammed even when things go wrong. There's a cool story about a bug on one of the rovers. I think it was, I think it might have been one of the Mars rovers where they just were able to reprogram it over the, in, over like the vast distance between here and Mars, which is crazy to think about and have it do something better, fix a bug. So yeah, outer space is a thing. And then for my final example, let's go back to medicine and talk about a very, very promising result uh, about what's called protein folding. So some software called AlphaFold 2, so there was an AlphaFold 1, this one's even better, uh, that learns, using machine learning, to do something called protein folding, okay? And what protein folding is, in case you haven't heard of it before, is when you try to predict the way that a protein is going to coil. I'm definitely not a biologist again, sorry. But here's the idea. If you, uh, like, DNA or RNA, it encodes proteins, right? It's being made, all those uh, amino acids are getting chained together in the way that the RNA is saying to chain them together. And then uh, somehow they like to fold themselves in a certain way based on those amino acids in that order, okay? So just so that we're all on the same page. And that order can tell you uh, the shape. And that shape determines what that protein can do, how it can interact with other proteins in its environment in general. And that helps you make medicines. Like I would like a protein that interacts with this particular chemical in this particular way to neutralize it or do some cool stuff with it. That's why this is a very useful problem. It can help you predict medicines even. Uh, and that is very helpful. Okay, so apparently they were able to give just the genetic sequence of these, uh, of a bunch of, what's it called, proteins, right, to AlphaFold2, there's like a contest, and these guys blew everybody else out of the water. We're talking like, I forget, in the 80s of percent accuracy, which was insane for the time. Like it can predict the way that a protein will fold so well that people were actually thought that they were cheating. It was that cool. So yeah, and just in general, the reason that this is important is if you can predict the shape better of this protein, you can better understand like how the cells that are making these proteins are interacting with themselves and other uh, biolog biological things, right? And also to make better medicine, to interact with other things in different ways or better ways. So again, if only I had another degree, I could tell you more about this stuff, but it's a really, really cool field and it looks very promising. Yeah, so I think that's all that I wanted to say about that. Are there any questions about uh, protein folding? Have we heard of it before? Did any of those words make sense? Did I say anything wrong? Are there any biologists in the house? Yeah, and apparently that just, that makes all the difference. That's crazy to me. Yeah, so maybe you guys can make the next protein folding software. That can be you. So that is in general all that I have for the day. So take the rest of the time to work on whatever's out that you need to work on. Uh, no new assignments. Those were all last week, right? But we are going to have some extra credit due. Remember that extra credit assignment. Uh, I think it's due sometime soon. So I will release the next one, I think, next time. Okay, so look forward to that. But that is officially all that I have uh, as far as content goes today.